John Fitch, MIT science reporter. So these are the San Gabriel Mountains, which are behind Patagonia, location of Caltech Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We're here to report on one of the most complicated space missions ever attempted, Project Surveyor, America's attempt to make a soft landing on the moon. Be sure to watch this exciting program on Science Reporter. Moon, a bleak, airless satellite of the Earth. Yet to man, this nearest of beacons in the blackness of space has always been an object of romance and wonder. And now that it lies within his heart, he is determined to know it firsthand. How a small and awkward-looking little spacecraft called Surveyor will help him in this momentous journey is our story today on Science Reporter. <laughs> I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter. Today, we're at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, to report on the vehicle which will make America's first soft landing on the moon. JPL, which is operated by the California Institute of Technology on behalf of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, has been helping to write some exciting new chapters in the history of man's knowledge about the moon. It wasn't until the 17th century that man got his first good look at the moon through Galileo's telescope. And only much later that scientists realized the importance of that cratered surface as a permanent vacuum-clad museum, perhaps even a model of our own barren planet as it circled the sun a few billion years ago. Over the years, technological progress has allowed ever closer looks at the lunar surface. But the cost of larger instruments and the limitations imposed by the Earth's own shimmering atmosphere have brought scientists into a region of ever-diminishing returns. The next important breakthrough fell of necessity to the space age, a camera-carrying probe to the moon itself. In July of 1964, after six failures or partial failures, Ranger 7 returned over 4,000 of these high-quality photographs before crashing contentedly on the moon. These photographs had better than a thousand times the resolution of our telescopes and contributed mightily to man's knowledge about the moon. But even with the large stores of data we've collected about the moon, both from Ranger 7 and from these Ranger 9 pictures, there remain many significant question marks. Is the lunar surface rough or is it smooth? Is it hard rock or mealy soft powder? Answers to these questions are imperative before man can be expected to venture upon the scene. Two spacecraft will be responsible for getting this vital information. By mid-1966, a lunar orbiter such as this should be circling the moon and returning more exact measurements of our oldest satellite shape, mass, and gravitational characteristics. At about the same time, a new page in space history may be in the writing with this unlikely little vehicle. This is the Surveyor spacecraft. And in spite of its seeming vulnerability and awkwardness, Surveyor is scheduled for one of the most complex space missions yet attempted by man, a soft landing on the moon. For it's only with a soft landing, where TV cameras and other instruments remain intact, that detailed facts about the nature of the lunar surface can be obtained, thus paving the way for the day when man first puts his foot upon the moon. While JPL has prime responsibility for Surveyor's development, production, and flight, Actual manufacturing goes on at Hughes Aircraft Company in El Segundo, California. To see one of the spacecraft and learn about its flight plan, we talked to Dr. Robert Roderick, Surveyor Project Director at Hughes. The Surveyor Environmental Test Facility, John, where we simulate missions to the moon. Really? We have here a real live spacecraft that has just recently completed two such simulated missions to the moon in the thermal vacuum chamber. This is a very strange looking object. It's not at all the way I would have pictured a, a spacecraft. Well, as you know, uh, between here and the moon, there, are, there isn't any atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And because of this, we don't need to streamline like you do in modern jets. Right. And without the streamlining requirement, we engineers put the equipment <laughs> wherever we want to put it. What is uh, all this, uh, what looks like aluminum foil or tin foil all over everything? Well, one of the problems that are, is important in the design of a, the Surveyor spacecraft is 
the control of the heat coming into the spacecraft and the heat leaving it. Mm -hmm. And the reflective surfaces we have here are to reflect the sun away where we don't want it to get hot, and the darker surfaces are to absorb the energy where we want to warm it up. That's very interesting. Uh, would you tell us now how it will work on its way to the moon and when it gets there? Well, the mission starts, as you know, at, uh, at Cape Kennedy. Mm -hmm. The launch vehicle is the Atlas Centaur. Uh, not too long after launch, when the Atlas Centaur has gotten out of the atmosphere, uh, let me show you on the model here how it works. Uh, there's a shroud over the uh, spacecraft while it's on the Centaur. This shroud is opened up after getting out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Then the surveyor itself is put into pretty much its landing configuration. The legs are oh. swung out like this, as you see in the real live vehicle here. Mm -hmm and the uh, antennas for communication are also swung out. Then after that is done, we inject, the Centaur injects the spacecraft on a trajectory to the moon. After the injection, the spacecraft separates and is on its own. Then we have a fairly critical maneuver to make. We have to get locked onto the sun, and we have to get locked onto the star Canopus. We want to lock onto the sun so that the solar panel, which we erect, receives the energy from the sun to power the spacecraft. This one up here doesn't seem to have a solar panel. The spacecraft here for test purposes has the solar panel removed. Oh, right. Now how do you get that pointed at the sun? Then we rotate the vehicle so as to point at the sun, and then we also rotate the vehicle in azimuth so as to point at the star Canopus. Now how do you, how do you know where the sun is and how do you know where the star okay, Canopus is? Okay, both of those have sensors, or both of those mm -hmm. uh, operations are controlled by sensors on this flight control sensor group. The sun acquisition is a little sun sensor here which detects the energy of the sun. Sort of a photocell? A photocell like. Right. Uh, the uh, stars are detected through the Canopus sensor here which allows us to lock on to the star Canopus. Now how, how do you turn this thing around while you're looking for what you're trying to find? Well we're already separated from the centaur so it can't help us out but what we do is we have some cold gas jets here mm -hmm. located on each of the legs, one on each of the legs, which squirt out uh, high pressure nitrogen in order to rotate the vehicle. Mm -hmm. The source of that nitrogen is a spherical bottle here, you can't see it too well, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, stores the nitrogen under very high pressure. But now, you haven't told me why you need to point it uh, in this you know, at the sun. Well, of course, the sun to get the power, but why, what does Canopus have to do with it? The operations that we perform in mid-course and terminally require us to know the attitude of the vehicle in space. We get one reference line from the sun and the other from the star Canopus. Right. And with this information, we can make both the mid-course maneuvers and the terminal maneuvers. If you want to correct the way you're going, you have to know which way you're pointed right now. Right mm -hmm. now, in order to get a reference for that. That's right. Well, now, when, when do you make this mid-course correction? Well, about 15 to 20 hours after launch, we make the mid-course correction, which uh, uh, we make in order to more accurately impact on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, the kind of information that we use is obtained from the ground system. It tells us how much uh, velocity correction to apply to the vehicle. We apply this velocity correction by using some small vernier engines here that you can see here on the vehicle. This is one of them. There are two others located symmetrically around the vehicle. These are little rocket engines? These are little rocket engines. It has a uh, rocket nozzle here, mm -hmm. and the uh, burnt uh, fuel exits down this direction. You don't use the gas jets for this kind of... No, maneuver. the gas jets are much too small to apply the forces to the vehicle we need for that mid-course correction. Right. Now, up till here, we've been describing a mission that has been, in effect, run before. The Ranger mission is very similar to this, except we have a special problem. Uh, Ranger, uh, because of its uh, operation, was allowed to crash into the moon. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to do that. We want to land <laughs> softly <laughs> on the moon. <laughs> right. Now, now, we're going to have to slow down somehow. And so we have to have a means of, of, of slowing down in a very careful and controlled way. As we approach the moon, we fall into it. and the velocities that we achieve uh, uh, are of the order of 6,000 feet per second, 6,000 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And in order to slow down the first major instrument, we have a large solid propellant spherical rocket motor 
which is so hard to see, but it essentially occupies the center oh, of this yeah, vehicle. I think I'm most of the room. Yeah. Its nozzle you can see down here pretty well. Mm -hmm. And we first, at about a thousand miles out, in order to use this engine, rotate the vehicle to look roughly at the moon. Oh, so now it's pointing so down. So now the that moon's way. pointing down here, mm -hmm. and we've got the rocket nozzle pointing at the moon. When we get to within about 60 miles of the lunar surface, a radar, which is located in the rocket nozzle itself, you can kind of see the shiny edge of it sticking out there. Well, that's a uh, sort of a dish antenna? It's a dish antenna. Mm -hmm. And that radar detects the distance from the spacecraft to the lunar surface, or its altitude. And when it gets to be about 60 miles, the uh, radar tells the main retro engine to fire. It fires and reduces our velocity in a fairly short length of time to about 350 miles an hour. What happens to the radar? It's right there in the nozzle. Well, the that's, a, that's a cute trick. We let the, uh, the engine itself throw the radar out in order oh, to save a little weight. Uh -huh. It's expendable. <laughs> now, when the engine has burnt out and we've slowed down to this 350 miles an hour, we're about 8 to 10 miles above the lunar surface at that time, we have these <coughs> small engines again, the ones that were used in mid-course, running. And so when the main engine burns out, it just falls out of the vehicle because oh. we're for forcing it up here, you see. Then you mean you're supporting the vehicle on these three little uh, rocket yes, engines? Yes, we, we carry the full weight of the vehicle on those rockets. The, the trick is that uh, uh, while the vehicle weighs 700 pounds and the rockets can only apply a thrust of maybe 300 pounds to it, the weight of the vehicle on the moon is one-sixth the weight oh, of the vehicle I see. here. Yeah, so they can uh, so carry So that they can mm -hmm. actually uh, carry the vehicle or hold it up. Right. Now, these engines are further slowing it down a ver in a vernier sort of a way, but they need to have information about the distance and velocity of the vehicle from the lunar surface. In order to obtain this information, we have a special Doppler radar system that's used uh, for this purpose. Uh, by the way, John, this particular radar is essentially the same as will be used by the astronauts in landing on the moon. And hence, it's particularly important to demonstrate the ability to do it with this type of radar. The radar is shown here. This is primarily the one of the antennas of the radar. You can see the feed system under here, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. which measures the velocity and distance from the spacecraft to the moon. That information is then put in the flight control sensor and is used by these engines in controlling the vehicle and bringing it essentially to a full stop at the lunar surface, properly oriented. Right. Now, that is exactly what we do. What we actually do is about 13 feet above the lunar surface. We cut off these engines and let the vehicle drop to the lunar surface. Why do you do that? Well, if we were to leave the engines on, we're afraid there may be enough dust on the surface, we don't know for sure, mm -hmm. that when they came down near the surface, that dust would be thrown up all over the vehicle and would uh, degrade the operation of the thermal surfaces and perhaps the television camera. So you actually let it drop the last 13 so feet? So we actually let it drop the last 13 feet. Now, that sounds like a long way to drop, but because of this ratio of lunar uh, gravity to okay. Earth gravity, it's only really equivalent to a few feet of drop, about the velocity that a parachutist might land on Earth. Still, I would think you might damage the spacecraft. Well, we've made provisions for that through uh, the use of a landing gear that's not too dissimilar with, with what is used on an aircraft. Mm -hmm. It consists of a leg out here with a shock absorber right oh along yeah. here. And then on the end of the leg, it isn't on this because of test purposes, we put a crushable structure that attaches on here and absorbs part of the energy of the impact. This, this crushes, you mean? This when crushes. It well, over here we have a foot pad that has been actually used in a simulated lunar mm -hmm. drop. And mm -hmm. you can see how the structure has been crushed here and how it absorbs the energy of the fall. That's very interesting. Well, now, assuming that you have landed uh, successfully, what happens? Well, the first thing we want to do after we land is to take some pictures. We have a TV camera that you can see up here. This is the mirror. It's closed right now, but normally it would be open. And it can articulate and look all around. But the first thing we want to do is to look down at this leg, look down at the, at leg? the foot pad, and see how far it's penetrated into the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. This will be the first clue we'll have as to the character of that lunar surface. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. The difficulties of perfecting the spacecraft design for a new mission are always enormous, and Surveyor is certainly no exception. Will it survive in outer space? The final answer will be known only after the spacecraft makes its actual flight. But reasonable predictions of its performance can be made right here on Earth. Huge simulators, such as this one at Hughes Aircraft, subject Surveyor to what engineers hope are reasonably accurate approximations of space temperatures and vacuum. Machines specially designed to simulate the vibrations of the launching rocket and the descent engines shake engineering models to determine their ability to function under the strain. After this test, engineers discovered adjustments in the solar panel mast were necessary. The mast was shortened and stabilized. On the basis of data obtained from countless drop tests, surveyors' legs and feet have been modified until it can settle upright on a large number of rough and sloping surfaces. Yet until the spacecraft does land successfully and send back pictures, no one can be sure that these test platforms are at all like the actual lunar terrain. Understandably, Surveyor's closed-loop descent system has posed the greatest development problem of all. Its radar component, retropropulsion unit, and three vernier engines must all operate in precise coordination and free from interference. In particular, engine vibrations cannot be allowed to confuse the radar sensors as they did in early design stages. But even successful test performances can be misleading. The spacecraft will be landing on the moon, where there's neither air nor wind, and where gravity is only one-sixth of that on Earth. Scaled-down models and stabilizing parachutes can help compensate for weight and wind, but the only truly reliable test environment for the descent system is the moon itself. Design problems for the mission weren't confined to the spacecraft. The Atlas Centaur launch vehicle, designated to boost Surveyor into space, is a new rocket with some inevitable wrinkles of its own. Centaur, the new element in the Atlas equation, was finally declared fully operational in August of 1965. It's a high-energy, liquid-hydrogen second-stage rocket, a dynamo capable of putting up to 2,500 pounds into deep space. Once the spacecraft and its launch vehicle have been successfully tested, the focus of attention shifts to the goals for which this complex mission has been planned. The prime purpose of Surveyor is to make a soft landing on the moon. Then, the collection of information about the lunar surface, particularly through the use of television. To learn how the TV pictures will be collected and analyzed, we talked with Dr. Thomas Verbalovich of JPL Space Sciences Division. This is the Space Science Analysis Area, and this is the area that operates the camera and receives the pictures as they're taken on the moon by the Surveyor spacecraft. Mm -hmm. This console is the Space Science Analysis Director's console, and next to him sits a, an assistant director who is sending the directing the people at Goldstone on what commands to send to the spacecraft to operate the camera when we get to the moon. I well, see the camera doesn't just operate automatically taking pictures. Then. No, we have two modes of operation. We can operate the camera manually by telling the people at Goldstone uh, what commands to send to the spacecraft and where we want the, the uh, camera to point. Or we have nearly 500 pre-prepared tapes that mm. have uh, given programs on them and with these pre-prepared tapes we can uh, go through a given set of patterns to get the m maximum amount of coverage in the minimum amount of time and uh, get the best possible information that we can get. Mm -hmm. These pre-prepared tapes have information such as uh, iris setting, uh, focal length, uh, focus settings, and uh, even color filters. Well, now, can you actually watch the pictures coming back on these uh, monitors here? Yes, we're able to see them on these monitors, but it's best to see them over in the engineering console where we have uh, the information that's transmitted back. The scientists sit next to the engineers here, but the main information that's coming back comes back on slow scan monitors that uh, look very much like this. Why does it um, go across here so slowly? This is the information exactly as it's being transmitted back from the, from the spacecraft. And uh, the information has to be transmitted so slowly because we have so little power available on the moon, we just can't send as much information back as rapidly as we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, we take this particular image and photograph it and uh, present it over here on at standard commercial television rates. Oh. 
In actual fact, we have a monitor upstairs, which is called a scan converter, that stores this image on it and presents it on this uh, at standard commercial television rates. In fact, there are two of these monitors, and uh, while the image is being laid down on one of the uh, storage tubes, and uh, it's being photographed on the second, and they alternate mm -hmm. and sending the pictures back. Well, this looks very much like the moon. What is it that we're seeing? Well, we have a panorama upstairs. This was a scene taken at, uh, out in the desert, and uh, we have a camera, a television camera, just like the one that will be on the Surveyor spacecraft in the middle of this panorama, and we go through training exercises with the camera in the panorama. We're able to send commands to the uh, camera, telling it to uh, change the mirror settings, change the asthma settings, and go through the focus steps and iris steps that we need to get the proper and best picture. How do you record these pictures for posterity? Oh, we record them in much the same way you do at a television studio. We record on magnetic tape. We also record on a 35 millimeter camera here. And we record on a 70 millimeter camera upstairs. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, we have a paper camera in which we get a very quick look at the photographs. This uh, camera has as its uh, primary uh, medium uh, paper. We have a slow scan monitor here. The shutter is open. The photograph is taken, placed on the paper. It's processed through here. And uh, within 25 seconds of the time that we've taken a picture, we have a, a photograph. We then cut that photograph on this uh, paper cutter, which also puts an identification number on the photograph. And uh, then after we've prepared the material in this way, we give the material to our mosaicer who then places this in relation to all the other photographs that we've previously taken. Well, I see each picture the camera takes is only a very small part of the big picture. Well, that's correct. This happens to be our uh, telescopic lens, and uh, it takes many, many uh, photographs, as you can see, to make up a complete survey. Mm -hmm. We also have a wide-angle uh, lens on the camera, and we can uh, plot the complete panorama with many fewer pictures. But these are the best resolution photographs. Now, how does he know where to uh, put them? They all look like little blobs of gray to me. Well, on the back of the photograph, there's a, a number, and that corresponds to a given azimuth and elevation that's mm. uh, been recorded on this platen, and he just has to fill in by the numbers mm. on this platen. Because you know where the camera's pointed. That's, that's correct. Now, what is this uh, sort of a javelin? Well, this is our low-gain antenna, and if... Uh, after we've made the uh, mosaic, we notice that the antenna is not in the photograph. Uh, it's either fallen off the <laughs> spacecraft or the camera isn't pointed in the right direction. What are, have you got any of these that are all put together? Yes, I do. Here's one that uh, uh, is completed, mm. and it's a whole narrow angle sector made up of nearly 100 pictures. Interesting. We have also a photograph of a mosaic that we made by taking the camera up to the roof of the building and uh, we photographed the building across the street, the telecommunications oh, yeah. building. Mm -hmm. You can see the windows in the building, automobiles parked on the street in front, and you can even see the gravel on the roof of the building that the camera was on. It's very fine detail. Uh, what do you actually expect to learn from these pictures you take on the moon? Well, by looking at the imprint of the uh, foot of the spacecraft on the moon, we hope to get an idea of the strength of the surface and its ability to hold a spacecraft. We hope to... Uh, get an idea of the topography of the moon by looking at uh, uh, fine mosaics like this, and to look at the fine detail in order to determine the uh, origins and perhaps the structure and the causes of the uh, material that we see on the moon. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Vrbalovich. The nerve center for all the surveyor flights is the Space Flight Operations Facility, or SFOF. To learn more about the project, we visited SFOF to talk with Surveyor Project Manager for JPL, Mr. Robert Park. This is the room from which we'll actually control the Surveyor spacecraft once it's been launched and uh, on its way to the moon and after it's on the lunar surface. We have displays up here which uh, give us the characteristics of the spacecraft and the status of all the ground equipment that uh, we use to control the spacecraft. How many men does it take to run a place like this? Well, there are several hundred, about 200, <laughs> 300 people in here, uh, very busy when, during an actual operation. Now how long does the whole uh, mission take? Well, we get started a few days before launch, and then uh, we could be busy in here up to about uh, 14 days. Why is that? That's uh, how long the sun shines on the lunar surface where we'll, where we'll be landing. Well, I hadn't thought about that. The, uh, 
the moon goes around the Earth in 28 days, and so half of the time the sun is shining on the on the side that we see. That's correct. So that's a lunar day. Spacecraft are designed to work mm -hmm. during the lunar day. Thank you very much, Mr. Bond. June 2nd, 1966. Dawn of a new lunar day. The continuing staccato of surveyor's telemetry indicated that the spacecraft had accomplished its primary mission. A soft lunar landing had been achieved. Then from across 250,000 miles of space came the first pictures taken by the spacecraft of the moon's surface. Initial photos which showed the leg of the spacecraft were wide-angle pictures. But soon, scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory commanded a narrow-angle telescopic lens into action, and photographs of exceptional detail began to arrive on Earth. In scanning the area around the surveyor, they showed it to be dark, relatively smooth and bare, encircled by a few hills and low mountains perhaps the remains of an ancient crater. The shadow cast by Surveyor itself assured scientists that the spacecraft had indeed landed intact. Detailed analysis of the impressions and shadows made by Surveyor gave invaluable information about the surface of the moon and has aided in the refinement of techniques for future manned lunar landings. The photos show that the surface is of a soil-like consistency and that scattered over it is a great variety of rocks and stones of all shapes and sizes. Some are thought to be the debris thrown out by meteoric impacts. Others, smoother ones, are of volcanic or molten origin. Small craters were photographed, too, some only a few inches in diameter. These reveal that the probable depth of the moon's soil is in the vicinity of three or four feet and that the landing site seems to be a representative sample of the so-called sea areas. The changing shadows resulting from shots taken at different times during the lunar day helped in calculations of size, depth, and distance of some of the observable features. As these shadows crept across the surface and the temperatures began to dip, scientists at JPL arranged the spacecraft for the long night that it was not expected to survive. It not only did live on, but it added more photographs during its second day. It's still living there, a monument to engineering achievement, quietly helping to assure the success of man's first step on Earth's nearest neighbor. Back in 1961, our space youth, as it were, the surveyor program was thought to be a relatively easy one, but experience has certainly made us considerably wiser. There can be no doubt that Project Surveyor is one of the most difficult space missions ever attempted. It requires all the techniques used in any unmanned space flight, plus a most difficult one, the soft landing. As this technique is mastered, man is very much on his way to the moon. I'm John Fitch, MIT science reporter.